Hello, Nevada. Happy afternoon on uh, Thursday, May 20th, 2021. Welcome to day two of our Funding Water Programs and Projects in Nevada, a webinar series. My name is Maureen Kerner. I'm the Associate Director of the Environmental Finance Center at Sac State. We've got a great dynamic uh, set of presentations and discussions for you today, talking about moving on from, uh, if you were able to join us last, uh, just past Tuesday, um, moving on from talking a lot about challenges and a couple of tips and strategies to more strategies for funding. Before we keep going, I want to give just a couple of housekeeping items. The webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will um, be sending link to the video shortly after the webinar completion today. The slides are going to be posted to our EFC at Sacramento State website I've got here on this slide and you'll see that several times throughout today. Um, you can always contact um, the, um, the, the test clerk um, from what you've got, the, uh, the, um, the request to join us today, or you can email myself too if you, don't, if you weren't able to receive those. Um, and we will let you know when the, when the slides are available. Today we're going to do, um, for Q&A, uh, there's going to be time for each speaker at the end of their presentations for you to send questions in. We're going to do all written questions, so on GoToMeeting you can use either the chat or the, or the questions um, menus to send those questions in. So moving on, I just want to say a great shout out and thank you to our sponsors, particularly the US EPA. Um, EPA is, uh, um, provides several grants to the Environmental Finance Center Network. I'll tell you a little bit more about them. My office, Environmental Finance Center at Sac State, is one of these centers from the, from the network. And uh, we're getting supported from several different grants, like I said, from US EPA. Um, some of the other environmental financers and their, um, their funding that's supporting today are that from the University of North Carolina, the Southwest Environmental Finance Center at the University of New Mexico and Syracuse University. And then we also were able to put this together. It was Nevada Division of Environmental Protection, Jason Cooper and staff at EPA Region 9 who came to us and said, hey, there's, you know, Nevada has, Nevada Div Division of Environmental Protection has funding and we really want to help our water systems or there would be drinking water, stormwater, wastewater, watershed planning, know more about the, the, the funding opportunities that we have but also an interest of capacity development. Let them know about some strategies as well as opportunities through technical service, um, technical assistance providers like those at the FC or Cal Water, Cal Rural Water, or excuse me, Nevada Rural Water or, um, or um, Rural Water or RCAC. Um, and so trying to give you all kinds of different strategies, not just for funding programs, but for funding projects. So the Environmental Finance Center is 10 different centers. They're located in, one is located in each region of EPA Region 9. Um, we focus on capacity development, technical managerial financial assistance, a whole slew of different things. And each center, um, while can focus, and there's funds to focus um, to support systems in their particular region, we overlap a lot. So University of North Carolina works in Hawaii sometimes. Um, University of New Mexico has done work for Nevada before and California and that. So there's there's kind of this great synergy between the centers and some of the different centers have um, different experience and capabilities than other centers. But here's just kind of a, a little preview of the things that we do, asset management, community engagement, um, rate, rate payer and citizen support, sustainability and resiliency planning. Um, there, is, um, there is funding available, technical, technical assistance or training. Um, we have a link in Tess. I will ask you to put that in the chat if you would. If you're interested in receiving um, system-specific assistance from any of our EFCs through the EFCN, you can go to their website and there's, a, um, there's an assistant training or assistance and training request form that you can fill out. So our office, EPA Region 9, we're actually located in the Office of Water Programs at California State University, Sacramento. Uh, we were started about 50, the Office of Water Programs was started over 50 years ago with a focus on providing training for drinking water, wastewater operators and managers, from manuals to now several online courses. 
we also about 30 years ago started a, um, a research program that focused a lot on kind of technical assistance and managerial assistance, focused initially in stormwater, but we've branched out into all different realms of the water world. Um, a lot of this has been focused in California. The EF EFC itself came uh, to be in 2016. We are one of the newer EFCs out of the whole network. Um, and then we've been able to kind of pull in the, the financial part of the TMF. So we do things again like asset management, GIS, GIS analysis tool and resource development, training, grant application assistance. So a little bit of background kind of to get it, to get our feet wet of you know, why, why are we here today? Um, why did this come about? Well, there's so many needs, whether you're drinking water, wastewater, stormwater, watershed planning, flood control, there's aging drain drainage infrastructure, climate change with floods and drought and fire and managing those things, um, decline and depletion of groundwater sources, emerging contaminants, new and changing regulations. So many demands on different water systems and water programs, all these things that um, that utilities need to do. And so you really come down with this question of what do we need? How much do we need? And how are we going to get it? So we put this um, this content together for the, the entire series. These, we're doing um, four different series. We started it on Tuesday. Today's day two. We're going to do another presentation on next Tuesday and the following Thursday. Um, with all these things that utilities and systems need to do, there's all kinds of challenges for that funding, whether it be program and management or a project that you're trying to get into the ground. So the grant and loan process can be burdensome. Sometimes there's local competing um, priorities. There's barrier, there's fee barriers. Sometimes it's difficult to get fees in place or sufficient fees in place. Um, a lot of people say there's staff time and capacity challenges. So a, Again, our intent is talk a little bit and recognize those challenges, but give you some strategies, some tips to address them. So we'll be doing identifying and categorizing program activities and estimating costs. We had a great webinar on that on Tuesday. I invite you to search out the recording for it. You can contact me or the EFCN if interested. Um, making clean water programs politically relevant to secure funding. That's going to be a lot of the focus today. Um, and then we'll also in the future have um, talks, um, choosing consultants and experts, working with them, planning projects, filling out applications. That'll be a focus for Tuesday, May 25th. And then Thursday, May 27th, we're going to bring in representatives from state, local, and federal funding agencies to kind of give you a face behind those opportunities and to talk a little bit about the, the eligibility of those, um, of those funding opportunities for projects and really let you know that you can reach out to them um, to start planning your projects or planning for applications and work with them to get that done. So it kind of went through a little bit. Um, first, Day was Tuesday, today's Thursday, day two, and those are focusing on the program funding. Um, so today, again, we're gonna be pursuing sustainable funding streams and revenues as the focus. Next week, we're gonna tr start focusing, um, transitioning into project funding, developing projects, preparing to obtain funding on Tuesday, and then applying for specific funding sources on, um, on Thursday the 27th. So uh, today we're, with pursuing sustainable funding streams and revenues. I'm pretty close to getting through my welcome to you all and setting the stage here. I'm gonna um, welcome John Bliss from SCI who will talk about funding for stormwater services. And you know, even though this um, series of webinars is focused on you know, other realms, drinking water and wastewater, John's got a lot of really neat, um, amazing tips and, and strategies and uh, that can apply here to your different type of water services as well. Jason Drew from NCE is going to talk about um, creating relevancy to drive funding for my program. Um, and then we have um, a special treat. Commissioner Vaughn Hartung from Washoe County is going to come and um, is, is with us today and he'll give you some perspectives from an elected official. And then I'll come and kind of remind you in, um, of, of our talks and then close things out and remind you of the next sessions coming up. Okay, so before we move on, Tess, can I go ahead and have you um, set the poll up for us so we can know who's with us today? 
Yep, absolutely. So folks on the broadcast, we would like to know what type of organization do you represent? So you can tell us whether you're a small municipality, medium, large, or if you're a consultant or if you're in education like a lot of us are, um, pick with the one that fits best. And we will give you three more seconds to get your response in. I'm going to close the poll in, in three, two, and one. Okay, and we have a lot of folks joining from the consulting sector today, also a fair bit of education and some large systems. Great, thank you, Tess. So I'm gonna um, get ready to turn it over in a second to John. And let me change. Yep, here we are with John. And I'll give you a little introduction, introduction read John's bio for you. And John, you should be able to, to share your screen now. Um, John, uh, John Bliss serves as president of SCI Consulting Group, California's premier firm for public agency revenue mechanism implementation and administration. John has led the development and implementation of over 300 post Proposition 218 fees, taxes, and assessments. John has a passion for quality public sector governments and services um, and motivates services and motivates his work at SCI and is demonstrated by his service on a variety of volunteer organizations in Oakland. John graduated from Brown University with a Bachelor of Science degree in engineering and holds a master's degree in civil engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, where he was a Regents scholar. He's a licensed professional civil engineer in the state of California. So John, thank you um, and welcome. Great, thank you, Maureen. Thank you, US EPA. Before I get started, Tess and Maureen, am I showing the right screen or do I need to do that swap? John, I don't think you're sharing your screen yet. I will resend the, I will send it to you in one second. Okay, great. So you should be getting that pop-up window. Yeah, no show screen i just clicked on it and then are folks seeing my screen unfortunately it looks like we're not seeing your screen at the moment um maybe for time's sake we can have um rich do the slides yes i'm ready Is that okay john sure um, it, can I, it would be helpful if I can see, can I see the slides? Yes. One sec. So you should be able to see Rich's screen in a second. He'll show your slides and then you can just tell Rich Perfect. next slide when you're ready. Okay. I will, I'm, I'm poised and ready to go and, and thank you everyone that is attending. We'll get the, uh, um, the technical stuff here settled in just a second. And if all else fails, Rich, if you're having trouble, I can, uh, since we know I'm having access, I can share John's slides as well. Great. Yeah, I'm just waiting for the share screen invite. Okay. okay. You should have it. It should be there. All right. Okay. How's everybody? Can you see it? Yes. Fantastic. That sounds great. Thank you, Rich, and thank you, everyone, for patience. We've been at this now 15, 16 months, and we still have an occasional technical uh, um, technical challenge, but we'll, we'll roll on and we'll roll with it. So thank you again, everyone, for participating. My name is John Bliss, and I work for a small firm in California that helps public agencies raise new revenue through a variety of sources. And so um, it's usually infrastructure and, um, and we do a lot of storm drainage. My presentation is kind of a one-two punch and it's gonna be followed by my good friend and colleague, Jason Drew. Jason and I work for different firms, but we work together on a lot of, pro lot of projects, particularly for storm drainage and, uh, um, and for, uh, as well as we've co-presented. 
my role is going to be procedural. I'm going to kind of tell you what are some processes that will work in Nevada and in other places for getting a, a, a reliable funding mechanism in place. And I'm going to pass off as I go through, I'm going to make reference to Jason, and he's going to come and tell you some of the lessons learned on how the politics. Now, like anything, everything we do in terms of getting a fee or revenue in place for um, storm drainage or any infrastructure is a political, it's a political exercise. There's no way to sugarcoat that. And we often as professionals working in infrastructure and water quality and water um, supply, oftentimes it's not how we we are wired and it's not how we typically like to work. There's no way to, no way around it. We've got to go with that. So why don't we go ahead, if I could get the next slide. Fantastic, thank you. So uh, this is a this is a slide where we talk about kind of what are the the main things that are um, that we're going to go with. And uh, um, so mostly stormwater is funded in Nevada and in California. You can just stay on that slide. That would be great. And uh, um, it is mostly by general fund. And so that's common. It's it's a it's a infrastructure. It comes out of the general fund, and that has been a challenge because general funds are usually stressed. And and one of the uh, shortcomings is we often get um, too too little funding from the general fund dedicated to storm drainage. There's also federal and state grants. We love grants, but grants require uh, lots. Of, they're competitive. They have lots of requirements, and they're limited in their use. When there's new development, we often um, will will put in a, assign a portion of the new development to pay for um, infrastructure. Again, that's limited because we we new development really only brings with it the revenue for the maintenance and operation of the infrastructure directly affected by new development. Sometimes um, municipal folks will say, oh, we've got all this new development in town. They're going to help us rebuild our storm drainage system. That's not really true. That's naive to think that that will happen. It really will not. Um, another way to do it that is common in California and in Nevada is to have a component, particularly of sewer, that pays for storm drainage. That can work. We have limitations in California legally. You don't have those same limitations in Nevada, but there's a political genesis. There, there's a reality that there's a limitation to how much water, sewer, or solid waste can pay for, um, for storm drainage, um, rehabilitation, capital improvements, uh, um, operations and maintenance. So that comes down to the two that we've already circled as a plan A and a plan B. The first one is, we're going to talk about, and so we're really going to talk about plan A and plan B. And I want to get really down to the details so those of you watching can see, hey, this is how we would actually do it. And so plan A is a direct fee for service is what we call it. It's a stormwater utility. It's not dissimilar to a water utility or a sewer utility. You have a utility, it has a governing board, that governing board votes and imp implements a fee for those services. Sounds straightforward. It is somewhat straightforward. The real challenge for that is political. And if you can do that, that's the way to do it. And that's why we've designated it plan A. Plan B is a harder, heavier lift but it has some political advantages. And that is to just go out to your voters and have a tax, just propose a new tax to your voters. Of course, that's often not popular, but there's some ways you can do that and ways that you can succeed that I'll go, go over. And so that would be plan B to go to your voters. Plan A is to get your governing board to just implement a, a, a fee on all users of the system. Plan B is to go out to the voters for a general tax. There are a couple of other approaches as well. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So we're this is plan A. So I want to get down and, and make sure that you guys understand. Typically in, 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 uh, um, in Nevada, it's either a county, county commissioners, or a city council. And, th and they control they fund, they are responsible for the infrastructure, in this case, the stormwater infrastructure. You can call it a stormwater utility or not. That detail is, is more to do with marketing and some of the st stuff Jason will touch on, but really the mechanism is the same. And that is it requires a, a, a 
affirmative vote, a majority vote of your elected officials to impose that fee. And so the first step you would do is if you say, hey, I'm in a city in Nevada, we need more funding for to rebuild our storm drainage system and for the operations and maintenance of it. The first thing you need to do is, is communication. Who do who are the decision makers, um, and who and and who do what information do we need to provide them so they would vote yes on an ordinance or a resolution that would impose this fee? And so you need to un identify the decision makers, and also those decision makers, most of them, most electeds will do what they should do, which is what is the the mood of the community, the representatives of the community. So you also will likely have to do some outreach and some community outreach to the community, even though they're not voting in this plan, the, the elected officials are voting, but you have to you have to appeal to both of those. Then the next thing you wanna do is develop a rate um, approach, and this should be rigorous. It should be based on, on um, financial projections, financial costs, uh, actual costs of the operations and maintenance of your storm drainage program, as well as capital repair and replacement over time. And so the, the public today and, and uh, elected officials are in lockstep. They require rigorous, detailed financial analysis. Gone are the days where you say, hey, just give us some money, we'll figure out how to spend it. That's not, that doesn't work anymore. So you have to come up with a methodology that would look at what is the what is the fairest way to put a fee on different properties? And generally what we look at is a nexus, a relationship between storm drainage and impervious area. So if some if a, a, a property is all paved, that means the rainwater will hit the pavement or the snow will melt and it will go into the storm drainage system. And so that particular property would have a high fee. A, a property that was bare ground and allowed most of the rain, very little of it to run off, most of it would percolate in. That doesn't put the same strain or burden on the storm drainage system and likely the fee would be lower. So most storm drainage fees are based on a percentage of impervious area. And there's a variety of ways to do that. That's not that that's an important detail to impose a fee, but not really important for our talk today. That'll work its way out. So you, you get your rigorous budgeting and what, what are your costs? You look at how we're going to distribute those costs up on, amongst our other our various property. And then that's where you have to write up a, a resolution ordinance that describes all of this stuff and go for a vote with your, your agency. So that sounds great, right? You just convince elected officials that they want to go ahead and do that and they'll vote yes and that sounds great. No, there's a it, it puts tremendous strain on elected officials because you are asking them to impose an additional um, tax or fee on their constituents. And, and, and they rightfully should be conservative and concerned about that. That's a tough, difficult ask. And so um, what happens is a lot of times elected officials will say, no, I'm not comfortable with, with that. You've got you've to show me the need and you've got to show me that you have public support to do this. This is why I would like to do that. Ironically, in California, we can't do that. So I, every, every fee for storm drainage is required to vote in California. So we can't just have the governing agency have a vote of the, a vote of the elected officials. We're trying to change that. But if we do change that, we are sophisticated enough to say that's not a panacea, that does not solve our problems because we still have the, the, the correct burden in it, and it is a good burden of convincing the decision makers, the electeds, that this, is a, uh, this need is legitimate and that, the, that we've done the, the work of reaching out to the community and, and making sure they understand that. So there, there is a weird thing. One of the things that we need to do is provide those elected officials some political cover. One way to do that is community outreach and to do a survey and show that it's supported in the community. Jason will talk more about some of the ways that you politic with elected officials and politic with your uh, your with your greater con community. So this is the plan A, do it as a utility, get your leaders to vote yes and go for it. So let's go ahead to plan B. So plan B is the next slide. And this plan B is tougher. And it is all, only would we do plan B if the elected officials say, you know what, we don't have the political support to do this. It puts um, put us puts us at risk, and we're not willing to vote um, yes in terms of that. What we would rather do is have it go to the the voters, go out to the voters, and let them decide. 
That's a reasonable request, and that's how we do it exclusively in California. As it turns out, there's a couple of ways that can happen. And there's two ways that any new tax can go onto a, uh, um, onto a ballot, and this is true in every state in the union. And one of them is the governing agency. So the elected officials say, I'm not willing to vote yes and impose this fee, but I'm willing to sponsor an, a, a ballot measure on the next election and let people decide. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is what we call a voter initiative. And a voter initiative is when um, the elected officials say, you know what, we're not in support of this. Voters have a process, and the state of Nevada has a process whereby you can collect a sufficient number of signatures, and that that necessitates the local governing body, a city or county, to put it on to put that forward to, to a vote. And so those are the two paths forward that you should consider, and both have pros and cons. There are different mechanisms of taxes that are common in Nevada. You can have a flat rate, that is every house pays the same amount. You can have gas taxes, sales taxes. And in Nevada, we have what's called a, a mill rate, some people call it. It's a percentage of the assessed value of the house. That's not legal in California, except for in rare situations, but it's common in most states where a tax might be a small percentage of the assessed value. Some people like that because larger properties and larger homes that are assessed more would pay more so there's there's pros and cons of that but then you're faced when you do when you enter this political environment you, there's some big questions that you should be faced with when do you do it what election what is the rate if we go out at two hundred dollars we will lose it's too high if we go at a hundred dollars maybe we can get get the required majority support so the rate is important when is report the details the methodology as i mentioned before do you have it a related to impervious area what types of of, of methodology do we look at there's a, a a community outreach the bread and butter politicking what is effective? What me what messages? Some folks uh, re respond to storm drainage because it's because of the profound and positive water quality environmental effects. Some people respond better if you say, you know, we need our storm drainage system to prevent local flooding. And so you need to understand your community and you have that outreach. And so you you look at the look at the different funding sources, and then you also have to evaluate the opposition. You may have some opposition. So this plan B, I'm going to talk, I think I have another slide or two on plan B, which is the voter approved approach. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, I guess this is a little bit repetitive. This is still the plan B, again, probably just trying to hit it home here. If, you, if your governing agency is willing to put forth the, um, the, the proposal to the voters, they need to pass a resolution to do that, and it would dictate what election that happens. The, if, if, the, if it's a voter initiative, if, if the elected officials are not willing to do that, a group of, uh, of like-minded community folks. For storm drainage, this happens rarely, but it does happen in California. It's usually an environmental group. It's a group that's concerned about water quality. They'd like to see more investment in storm drainage and water quality. And so they'll get together, they'll raise some money, it may be a local nonprofit, and they'll write up an ordinance and a methodology, they'll collect the signatures and they'll get it on the ballot that way. And so the, both of those methods can be good. Um, one of the considerations and one of the issues we have in California is if it's a voter initiative, it's written by the nonprofit group. And that nonprofit group has goals and uh, um, and and desires and and preferences, and so they may write it in a way that's not optimal from the from the city or county standpoint. So they often will try to um, negotiate back and forth. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so I wanted a little bit more on the voter approved process, just a little bit more on the process, and so the, really what happens is that the the measure is drafted and it will be it might be a five or ten page ordinance or resolution that's going to be voted on by the and let's say this is not a voter initiative let's say the governing body the city council says yeah we'll put this forward and so there's they they, they work with staff and the city attorney and experts to draft a a an ordinance that will go before the voters and um that is the, the draft happens and it identifies what what the needs are. 
one of the things we recommend and is very common in California and, and we would recommend folks in Nevada consider it, is at that point run a survey. So a, a, a survey is a relatively inexpensive, relatively accurate way to understand the preferences and priorities. And it can help re answer some of these questions. Like you may not know, will folks vote yes if it's $50 or $100, $200? You need to understand that, that, that price sensitivity. So that's one of the things that the survey will answer for you. It'll help you with some of the details um, it'll help you with what messaging, what are people responding to? Is it infrastructure? Is it local flooding? Is it water quality? All of those types of things can be answered by a survey. It'll help you ferret out some of the opposition. And so for most of our storm drainage measures, we will run about six months before we do the storm drainage measure, we will run a survey and that survey will help answer those questions. Um, then there's the administrative tax. Once, once the uh, um, the governing body has said yes, we will we will put this on the the ballot. We've we've conducted the survey. We've fine tuned the resolution, and it has all the elements. We think it's it's we learned a lot from the survey, but now we kind of know what we want in this. <clears throat> then we work with the register of voters to make sure that the all the documents are filled out. The register of voters will have all kinds of requirements in terms of timing and, and arguments, pro and con, and all that good stuff that goes and you go with that. But then parallel to that effort is the communications and the outreach. And communications and outreach are, um, again, Jason's going to talk to talk to you about kind of the fundamentals of that, but it's, it can be very bread and butter, just like any other campaign you may have been around, where there's social media, there's endorsements, there's mailers, all of that kind of stuff. And we see that all the time. It's, it's, it's effective for infrastructure. Folks will vote yes for infrastructure like storm drainage if they, if they believe it's credible and they understand some of the issues. Um, a, a lot of times, the, that type of work for public agencies, those of you that are from public agencies at, at the webinar here today, is it's often done by a consultant because it may be once every five or 10 or 15 years that your agency goes forward with a tax like this. So you may not have that specialty in-house. So oftentimes it's by a consultant, but some, some agencies do it and do it very successfully in-house. It's really, it's your own preference. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So I'm going to do some case studies. Now, in, in Nevada, Nevada, the politics in Nevada are different and the funding is different and, and there's less taxes and less ballot measures in Nevada. That's good if you're probably from Nevada, you probably like to hear that. We, we've got a lot more of that in California, largely because there's real limitations on how much property tax can be collected. So for a Californian, when we look at our property tax bill, we often have 15 or 20 other fees, taxes, assessments that are part of it. And that's just how, how we've structured us. Nevada and, and Nevada system is better. Your elected officials make decisions on budget each year and can adjust that mill rate each year to kind of come up with, with, with uh, um, what is the right amount. Your, your, the politics in Nevada tend to be very responsible, fiscally conservative, so that's why you've kept your taxes down. Um, but there were some case studies I wanted to share with you occasionally in Nevada, and so we'll go through these pretty quickly. So let's just go ahead and go to the next one. So this is in Carson City. Um, this is a stormwater utility. So this is the plan A where the, the elected officials have voted and they voted affirmatively. They came up with a fee. I, I included on the slide there the, the fee schedule and that's fairly straightforward. It's now been well adopted and is it has worked and I've got the, the, uh, um, the link there if you guys wanna learn a little bit more about it. So that's a plan A, the local public agency that's responsible for storm drainage voted to impose this fee. Great way to do it, um, great leadership by those elected officials and it's working well. Let's go to the next one. So this is a fun one. This really went nowhere. I wanted to bring it up because it is, it was a voter initiative and they're fairly rare in Nevada. This was several years ago, six years ago, the MLS was thinking of putting a team into Las Vegas and um, a soccer team. And so there were citizens that said, you know what, that may be great, but we wanna protect the city coffers so that none of the public money goes towards this soccer team. This is something that cities um, deal with all the time. And, and really the, this is not very related to storm drainage. I just wanted to in, include it 
Um, and, and, it, and then actually the signatures itself became a little bit controversial. But in this particular case, there was someone called the Parks Protection Committee. They wanted to make sure the city money was spent on parks, not on a professional soccer team, and they collected and submitted signatures. It ended up the, the city council in Las Vegas went ahead and adopted what they wanted anyway, so it, it was kind of moot, but just this is an example of a voter initiative in, in Nevada. So let's go to the next one. So these are a couple in Washoe County. As you can tell, I like everything about um, about Nevada, except for how you guys name your um, ballot measures, because there's a 2016 Washoe County measure called WC1, and then a 2018 Washoe County one, WC1. And so that was confusing. It took me a long time to figure those were different things. Good examples of, of, of taxes. The first one was, they're both Plan B, they're both voter initiatives. The the first one was for schools and was successful, passed at 56%. The second one wasn't successful. It had to more to do with flood control. I don't have a lot of details on it. Probably some of you at the uh, webinar today know far more than I will never know about, uh, ever know about it, but just wanted to give you examples of that. And the second one was not successful. So let, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So real quickly in California, just wanted to touch on this. If you see the table on the right, it's probably too small for you to read. Realize there's 500 incorporated cities in California and 58 counties, and all of them have storm drainage needs. But if you if you can kind of see the chart on the right, there's only about 30 or 40 different entities there. So a, a, a less than 10% of California agencies have gone forward with dedicated storm drainage measures. And that's disappointing and it's disappointing. They all have the responsibilities. They've been they've been running a very lean budget. It's been general fund. They've just been, been barely making it, but, but that's changing. As, as the population understands the importance of infrastructure and storm drainage more, we're seeing more of those. So I just listed six of those that, and, and Jason and I are working on some of those and some of those we're doing on our own. But those are some examples of cities that are going for some, many of them about Balloted. I think four of those have already won, and Del Mar and Davis. Davis is balloting right now, the city of Davis, California. And so it's becoming more popular to do and, and, and more successful. So all of those have been successful. So let's go to the next. So um, let's see the proper, oh yeah, go ahead and click a couple of times. I have some, I have some animations here that I think we want to see. Let's just click ahead and go that. Just wanted to touch the California process is not dissimilar. You do a fee study, you, you mail out a notice, you conduct a hearing, and then there's a ballot and, and then you tabulate the votes and it's a 50% of property errors are in support. You can see the graphic there. That's a typical looking, um, ballot handout and it, it gives you some information. It shows some, some, some pictures. We usually like to have a sinkhole to show how if you don't take care of your storm drainage system, it can all flood and we give budgeting and what is the, the, the meaning of it, all of that kind of stuff. And I think if you click one more time, there will be a ballot so folks can see what that looks like. That's just, a, and click again, that's just a map. It showed, we showed some, some bad looking storm drainage. So then the ballot comes in a mail. In California, we have a process where it's a mailed ballot and it's to property owners and they get to vote one way or the other. So let's see, that may do it. I think I have one conclusion slide after this. So let's go ahead and go to that slide. You can see the yes, no on that. Um, oh yeah, I did wanted to touch on, this is another thing that we always encourage, it probably goes without saying, before you go to do plan A or plan B, there's often lots of opportunities, I shouldn't, lots is probably too strong of a word, but there are opportunities for, to reduce your budget and spread the storm drainage budget. This is really focusing on storm drainage. Um, the, the, there's lots of interest in green streets, which is basically a fancy way of doing, um, talking about infrastructure, local street infrastructure that is more sensitive to water quality, where you have percolation ponds and all kinds of impervious um, pavements, all kinds of stuff that can go into a, a rain garden, all of that stuff. And a lot of times we would encourage you to look for transportation funding that may be able to help with that. 
Of course, lots of storm drainage are multi-benefit in terms of environmental, um, waste control, transportation. And we, for those of you that are storm drainage fund, we always encourage you to get involved with other, sometimes often too siloed, different um, agencies and efforts and see what you guys can work together and share those costs. And, and as I understand, there's a lot, there's been a number of plans developed in Nevada that make reference to this that probably need to be implemented. So that's just a reminder on that. So let's go one more slide. So my final thoughts on communication, be more political, lean in, get involved um, on storm drainage. You should be in every meeting, planning meeting. Storm drainage is equally as important as water, sewer, refuse collection. So we need to change our culture and make storm drainage more of a, a powerful thing. You need to um, look at whether you're gonna do a ballot or a utility. Um, detailed financial engineering, rigor, authenticity, all of that kind of stuff. And, and what we've learned on storm drainage messaging, we, for too, too long um, in our history, we focused just on the water quality elements of storm drainage, and storm water. Let's do this to protect our, our receivable waters, res, res, um, um, protect fish and other wildlife but really that didn't resonate as well with the public as if we took a step back and talked more about pipe and heavy stuff and flood control. So we often message it, why do you pay for storm drainage? You, it'll help you prevent local flooding. It'll help, we need to rebuild our infrastructure. And while we're doing that, we're gonna improve water quality. So we tend to lead more with flooding and infrastructure and then layer that on top of some of the environmental um, environmental benefits that, that responsible storm drainage management will help with. Um, and, and by doing that, we were able to increase the amount of, of revenue people were willing to vote yes on. They, 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 if you ask them which of those they like, they like them all the same. But if you ask them and you associate it with a dollar amount, you, people will pay more to prevent local flooding than they will to protect even endangered species. That's the nature of the beast. I wish that wasn't true, but that's what we've learned. So I think my next slide is a conclusion. Plan your approach, get experts, decide whether you wanna do a community-wide tax utility, conduct a survey, implement a mechanism, community outreach, community outreach, et cetera. And then I think I have one final slide for questions and I'm gonna get some help from Tess or Maureen. Maureen, did I use up all my time or should we do some Q&A now or what, what's the best you know, step path forward? I'm so good that I include some buffer time for you because we do have some questions and I want you to be able to answer. Right. Them. So, so doing okay. Ahead. Okay, so question one, if the utility is based on impermeable surface percentages, how do you quantify it? Is that a huge map? Isn't that a huge mapping effort? Who absorbs Great the question. evaluating so the amount of impermeable surface? Great. It, it, it is. That's a, a, a fantastic question. There's a couple of approaches. One of them is, as you say, it's a huge mapping effort. And we actually have a city that did that. The city of Menlo Park in California essentially did that. They used remote sensing and aerial. Many of our clients, there's too much tree cover and the technology isn't quite there to go parcel by parcel and determine the impervious area. It can get fooled as well and it's imperfect. So here is what we've done and we think this is good. It's been reviewed by a number of attorneys. Is it, let's say there are 10,000 single family homes. We will randomly select 500 or 250. We'll do a random selection of those properties. And of those properties that we look at, we will we'll look at, we'll actually look at the aerial in, in great detail and calculate out the percentage impervious versus pervious. It's usually the paved driveway and the roof line. There's, there could be some other concrete. And so we'll, we'll look at averages. So, so the answer to the question is no, in most cases, don't do that huge, huge exercise, mapping exercise. If you can do it, afford it, sure, that's great. But if you can't, you can take a random sampling, get a representative sample, and then base your percentage on that. Thanks, John. And I see that um, Jerry Bradshaw has his hand raised, and I know he's your colleague. He um, is. Uh, so yes, can we get can we get um, Jerry um, speaker access to weigh in? Yep, we sure can, Jerry. I did make you a panelist. If you're prepared and like would like to chime in, you can go ahead and unmute and do so. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay, Maureen. 
Yes, sounds great. Great. I actually chimed in because I wasn't sure John could answer it right, but he did a very good job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm the actual uh, boots on the ground for that sort of thing. So basically, like he said, we do a statistical analysis and we find a really strong trend between lot size and impervious surfaces. And we look for breakpoints and we just work from that. Commercial, uh, apartment buildings, all the different land categories, we see good strong trends. And there's a few other tricks you have to apply, but we don't map out the entire city. We feel pretty confident that that's adequate. Great, and thank you, Jerry. I, 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 you are being too kind. I thought you were going to come on and correct me, but you were very gracious. I appreciate this. I will share one of the one of the the trends we get, which is kind of counterintuitive. Oftentimes, we will break even single family homes into three sizes: a very small lot size, a medium lot size, and a big lot size. Of course, the small lot size has the highest percentage of, of impervious. That means that the roof line and the driveway take the higher percentage of that lot, but the overall percentage is less than the bigger one. That biggest lot may have a lot more, a, a grass lawn, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so the percentage of the, the, the parcel is less impervious, but the total impervious area is often often higher. So we, we, we feel we have to manipulate that and, and use that as part of our analysis. Thanks, John and Jerry. A couple more questions. You, I, John, I think you did answer this one, um, but maybe just a repeat. Um, so in, in Nevada, so in Nevada, you don't need a vote, just political leader support? Yes. Yeah, so my understanding in Nevada is, and I've, I've looked at this, is there's two choices. One of the choices is 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 what is often called a star, stormwater utility. I, I have mixed feelings about using that term, but for this case, it's a good good way to think of a, 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 um, a, a, we know what a water utility is, which is an enterprise where you pay and you get water or sewer. It's usually a flat rate or something in sewer and you pay. And so think of that same model for storm drainage. And so the, the governing agency of that storm drainage system can take a vote directly and, um, and, and impose a fee. And actually for most of the history of California, that was true. It was, it was really um, Prop 218, which passed in 1996, and then was litigated through the early 2000s where it became clear we couldn't do that. Now, as I said, I think I mentioned, we're pushing back against that. And there are some, some, some bills that have been passed that seem to indicate that no, you don't need to take a vote. You can go ahead and have your, your local agency who runs the storm drainage system just vote and impose a fee like a utility. So that still, that, that still needs to play itself out in court. But over the last 25 years, you've had to have a vote in California. You don't need to, that, that, that's one of your two ways to do it in Nevada. Great, thank you. A few more questions for you. If you so this one's kind of focused on Washu County. If you do a percentage of assessed property values, how does the work with how does that work with Washoe County, where we have a system that that assesses values based on historic value? Older homes have less property tax. Yes. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure I don't get out, stray out of my lane too much because I don't know the details on Washoe County and the effect of older homes and assessed value. So I'm going to speak generally, and if I and I, if I'm wrong on some of this, I apologize, and and I'll try to do some additional research. So so what happens in my understanding in Nevada, and this is true in most states, California is really the outlier, is you can impose a new um, impose a fee or tax based on a percentage of the assessed value. That has a, a couple of, of limitations. And that, as, it, as I think the questionnaire was saying, is the, the, uh, an older house may have a lower assessed value. The assessed value should be the market value, but in some cases it's lower because it doesn't, it doesn't track with the, the market value. So pro house A has, is, is the same as house B, but house B was recently sold, so it has a higher assessed value. 
if it's a percentage of the assessed value, then you could say, well, why are they, they're getting the same services? Why is one paying more than the other? We really have that problem in California because we get this amplification because there's a limitation on how much that assessed value can increase each year. So that's a, it, it's, it's a, I, I say it as a problem, but it's a, it's a challenge. It's a political challenge. It is what it is. You, you, you just describe what's going on. One of the issues with using assessed value for storm drainage is you lose the ability to look at that impervious area as a factor. And that's why it may make more sense to do a flat rate. And, and as we saw in Carson City, they have a flat rate per use. That's pretty good. You could have, you could say every house that was on a quarter acre or less is $20 a month. And every house that's from a quarter to a half acre is $30 a month. And if you're bigger than a half acre, then it's $60 a month or $60 a year, whatever the rate is, you can you 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 have more ability. If you don't use a percentage of the assessed value, you have more ability to maybe fine-tune your fee or your tax that is more, there's a stronger relationship between the use or the the burden on the storm drainage system i i hope that answered the the question but but certainly i'll i'll leave my email and if, if, if we want to discuss that further we can go ahead and do that okay two more questions hopefully you can Great. get through um to get a fear tax in place how long does the process typically last from start to finish Great question. So to, the, the, to, to get a fear tax in place, I want you to think 12 months. And I want you to think um, a couple months of planning. We really like the survey. It's a good investment and a survey may take three or four months. And then the overall process is, is, is eight months. So the overall balloting and all that eight months. So really, if you want to be successful, you got to start at least a year out. Early on, you might start saying, you know, which election are we looking at? Are we looking at November 2022? We ought to be a year to 18 months out where you're starting to, to communicate, see who your decision makers are, your stakeholders, all of that kind of stuff. But once you kind of go, we're going to go ahead with this, we, we would say the quickest you could do it would be eight months, but typically 12 months with a survey, and you're actually planning and discussing it before that. Many fees and taxes for storm drainage are kicked around for two or three years before we start that 12-month sprint to make it happen. So uh, one more question came in, so I've got two more for you, and then okay. I think we'll go ahead and move on to, to, to Jason. I'll, I'll be there. So I'll be there. Do you have, are there examples of measures or initiatives that combine sectors such as water and schools or parks? There are, um, and, and I wanna talk about that. There, there are, and so some sometimes the public responds better to a combination. Um, I actually, as a volunteer in my hometown of Oakland, we, we had a recent ballot measure that I worked on that combined homelessness services with parks. You can do, there are some natural fits, water quality and creeks with parks. There's things like that. And, and really the, the survey will help you with this. And, and I, I, let me just cut to the chase on that. Sometimes the public responds better to a bigger comprehensive approach. We'd like to, to deal with the water quality, the trash problems and the parks problems all in one. We're gonna present that to the voters and we would like to handle that comprehensively. And that can be very appealing. However, often what happens if we do that, our rate that we're gonna ask for is $100. And so I'm gonna put on my cynical political consultant hat. And sometimes, unfortunately, if you did a measure for $50 for parks, and then a year later you did a measure for $50 for creeks and water quality, they both have a, a you, you get the same hundred dollars and they both have a better chance of winning than putting it all in one. So again, it's a tactical strategy decision. The survey can help that, but I do all, we always encourage that you look more comprehensively. There's no question in the surveys we've been running that the public's appetite for bigger regional, more comprehensive approaches is increasing. So people want big solutions. They they are less likely to want the small solutions. Okay, final question. Inter interesting perspective on, or different perspective on multiple benefits. So, um, okay, last question. Any thoughts on rebates or discounts for those who who reduce their imperme impermeable? We space? love those. And I know, Jerry, I'm going to be quick and Jerry should feel free to jump in. This is something our firm likes and we've seen success in the state and it's really good for storm drainage. So we, we, we have, um, we often, 
with our clients say, hey, let's put in some rebate if they use a rain guard or, or, or a rain barrel, all kinds of things if they if what they can do, because really what we're looking at is to take the burden off of our system and get that water flowing back into the ground. So we love the rebates, we love discounts. The, the, however, how and there's always a however, there is an administrative burden that sometimes is not trivial. So if if you had a fee that was a hundred dollars a year and we're going to reduce it to fifty dollars a year, if they uh, um if they if they get rid of their driveway and have a dirt drive. That's a terrible example, but something like that. Then you have to inspect that. And that costs you more than the $50 that you save. So a lot of times, believe it or not, this may sound crazy. We, we recommend a discount or something and it's on the honor system. And we just have people fill out a form or something like that. Because if you get into the inspecting, and I know Jason's probably also um, chomping on the bit because the city of South Lake Tahoe has, has a, a real story to tell on that, where the, where the burden of inspection over time um, really, really put a, a real strain on a system they had. So in theory, if you do it right, don't get too ambitious, don't have too much administrative burden. It's a good idea because we're really trying to get folks to be more responsible on their storm drainage. I think I can I, thank you, Maureen. Thank you all for listening. I'm going to hang out and listen to Jason and others. And um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to jump in. And then also, I think you have my email. Thank you again for your time. Lean in. Let's get it done. Let's start bringing, um, living to the promise of storm drainage. John, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, your expertise with us today. Great presentation. Tess, you can probably go ahead and just set, um, send uh, Jason the invite to share his screen, his slides, and I will go ahead and introduce Jason. And it looks like he's coming on with us. Jason is a principal scientist and the practice lead for NCE's Watershed Science and Planning Service line. His professional focus is integrating the disciplines of engineering, science, and planning to inform sound policy and solve complex resource challenges. Technically, Jason, Jason specializes in storm water management and restoration design. When not in the office, Jason spends his time in the Sierra Nevada mountains or on Lake Tahoe with his wife and three kids. So welcome, Jason. Thanks so much for being here and take it away. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. So we're gonna shift a little bit uh, our discussion. John did a good job of overviewing some of the, the legalities and process to how you go about obtaining funds. And, and he kind of talked a bit about from the perspective of clean water programs, but it really does apply to the broader water world, whether it's water, sewer, flood control, drainage, uh, or clean water. And so in my presentation, uh, we're gonna talk about moving the needle and how we can help shift people's thoughts and processes to support the things that we think are important so that we can gain the funding we need to implement our programs. And again, I'm gonna use the term clean water throughout my presentation, but this really can apply to uh, water systems, sewer systems, drainage, flood control, uh, and clean water. <clears throat> I think we lost some audio. Um. There we go. Sorry, went to mute. Um, I'm a, a big Dilbert fan. And for those of you that have ever um, dealt with uh, water or infrastructure, you feel like you've had these conversations where it's like, man, if we just had a certain amount of money, it's the amazing things that we could do with it. So I love this Dilbert cartoon because I feel like I've had this exact conversation in my career many times. We're going to focus on three things here in the next 20 or so minutes. First, we're going to talk a little bit about the realities of funding clean water. And again, these can apply to many of the other aspects of water, uh, whether that's flood control, sewer, water. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of we, we need to shift our mindset about how we think about the things we do on an everyday basis. And then we're going to close out with talking about how we create political relevancy, because the bottom line is, is that if we want to gain the funding we need for our programs, we've got to be more relevant than we are today and have been in the past. 
So those are the three things we're going to focus on. If you were a part of Tuesday's presentation, then this some of this will build on what you heard on Tuesday, and that's really related to uh, some of the realities of, of funding uh, clean water. Um, and there are many aspects to this. There, there's <clears throat> regulations that are growing every day. And in the clean water world, they can be things like total maximum daily loads or permit reissuances or trash requirements we're seeing growing in states across the U.S. and particularly in the West. Uh, and those regulations apply to whatever part of water that you're talking about. At the same time, for us to be successful in the things that we do in the water world, we've got to have strong community buy-in. And that's only growing for us to be successful. And that's not an easy thing to do. And then on top of that, costs are rapidly increasing. Any of you who are involved in the capital side of your program know how much labor and material costs have increased in the last 18 months. With that, the financial need that we have for our respective programs often far outweighs the community and the political support that exists within our communities for our program. And what that leads to is, again, you can have clean water, you could insert flood control, drainage, sanitary systems. You know, we just tend to be chronically underfunded, and in some cases, if we have funding at all. So that kind of gives you a sense of some of the things we're dealing with just globally uh, in the water world. The first question that often gets asked in the discussions that I'm a part of is, why, why is it so underfunded? Why in the water world are we so underfunded? And why is it such a struggle to get the buy-in that we need at all levels? And what you can see on the screen here is there's a whole variety of reasons why we are underfunded and why we struggle for buy-in. But the one that I really want to focus on today is it really comes down to we're just not politically relevant. And when we say that, it's, you know, are, are you the first or the second or the third thing from in a decision maker's mind? And the reality is, is we're not first or second or third. We're not even 10th. A lot of times we're we're far down the line. And so what we need to be able to do is become more politically relevant so that we can garner the support we need for our programs. The first question I always get asked when I start talking about relevancy is, okay, so what do we do? So any of you that were fans of Saturday Night Live in the 90s, uh, you know, Matt Foley, one of Chris Farley's most favorite characters, you know, ideally it'd be great if we could just, you know, put Matt Foley down in the basement, load him up on a bunch of coffee and just unleash him on all the decision makers so that we could get the, the, the support that we need uh, financially and politically for our programs. Unfortunately, uh, you know, he's no longer around, so we can't do that. So we've got to look for a different way to move forward. And what it comes down to is fundamentally, we have to shift the mindset that we have as uh, professionals in, in how we think, how we talk, and how we sell. And again, I have clean water here, but you could insert sanitary, water purveyors, flood control, drainage. We really need to shift from how we've done things for the last 50 years and, and shift how we're going to do that moving forward for the next 50 years. I like to think about it as we really need to evolve. And there's five things that are important to do to make that evolving uh, come to reality. And some of this that I'm gonna speak about right now will build a bit on if you participated in Tuesday's session, builds on what was discussed on Tuesday. First and foremost, the most important thing we need to do, regardless of what your program is, is clearly define the program. I can't tell you how many jurisdictions, cities, counties, special districts I've worked with, and I'll ask very simple questions about what their program are, is or, or has been, and I'll get varying answers. And so we need to be really clear about what our program is, and we need to think differently. It's really hard for all of us that, that are, have engineering or science or planning backgrounds that tend to be more technical. We need to take those hats off, and we need to really think about it from the perspective of the, the average person use simple language because a lot of the acronyms we use in the water world are meaningless to 99% of the population. 
the, unfortunately, that 99% are the people who are making decisions ultimately. So we need to make sure that we're using language that resonates with them. The other thing is we want to make sure that we're comprehensive. There are many uh, different programs in the water world that I've worked with at jurisdictions, and I'll often ask them what their program is. They'll give me a list, and then we'll start to talk about it, and we'll realize, oh, there is this other part, but it's it's implemented by a different division or a different group or a different department or maybe even a different agency. Those are all part of your program, so you want to be comprehensive. And you want to be really clear about what are the services that you're providing and who's receiving those services. And think about defining your program from that is services delivered and who they're delivered to. Once you've defined your program, the next thing you need to do is really justify your need. And you heard John talk a bit about this in his presentation in terms of the bottom line is how much do you need? How much does your program cost? And I've worked on a lot of costing of different water programs and you would be shocked how frequently there is underestimations of what the actual costs are on an annual basis for different kinds of programs, whether it's clean water programs or flood control programs. So you need to be really clear. Um, how much do you need? And it needs to be a defensible number. There's nothing will undercut your efforts to secure funding than throwing a number out there and not being able to defend it. Because the first question that will usually be asked is, how did you come up with that number? And if you don't have a good answer, you're dead in the water. So you need to know how much you need and it needs to be defensible. Then you need to start thinking about how much funding do I have now? And where does that funding come from? And how sustainable is that funding into the future? And if it's fairly sustainable, then you have an easier time figuring out what your delta is between how much you need and how much you have now and what you need to fill in that gap. So define your program, justify your need, make sure you're really clear and defensible about the financial needs that you have. Once you've done those two things, the next step is something that starts to become pretty foreign for most of us uh, technical people with engineering or science backgrounds that work in the water, water world. Almost none of us took a political science class or a marketing class in all of our time in school, and we really don't deal with those issues very frequently in our professional lives. So the next couple of things I'm gonna talk about are, are things we, we all have to get more comfortable with. And the first part is coming up with a compelling argument. The image on the left is a gentleman named Simon Sinek, and he has one of the more famous TED Talks that's, uh, that's ever been viewed. And I would encourage you to go uh, to YouTube or to the TED website and look up uh, his discussion on Start With Why. It's also a book that he wrote. And it's really focused on um, starting to, to, to think differently about how we talk to people about the programs we're involved in. And his question is always is, what is your why? And, and it's based on the concept that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And from a technical standpoint, most of us are really good at telling people what we do, but we're not very good at telling people why we do it. And so the idea is we've got to come up with a compelling argument as to why people should care. How can we create an emotional connection between the, the program that we have and the goals that we have and, and getting personal investment from those that we need support from. So coming up with a compelling argument is really critical. Once you have that compelling argument, then we gotta do the branding and messaging. And, and this is the part that gets real foreign for people in the water world, but it is absolutely a must. It, it, it's so critical and crucial to the success of programs, especially in garnering funding, that these are just all different images of either uh, efforts that I've been involved in or some that I've seen that I think are very clever and have been very effective. But you gotta build on that compelling argument and you have to create visual and verbal keys that people can connect to. Without those, it becomes very challenging. And I would encourage many of you Whatever community you're in, just Google whatever your local flood control or clean water or sanitary system is and just look at what their homepage looks like or what their latest press release looks like. My guess is this is an awful lot of text. Very little of it is visually appealing and it probably uses a lot of narrative 
that would be very difficult for most of the average people who would go to that website to be able to read and understand. So coming up with branding and messaging is, is really critical. And then the last, the fifth of these five steps is, and again, define your program, justify your need, come up with a compelling argument, put together branding and messaging. And then the fifth piece is, we've got to take a different approach. As I mentioned earlier, what we've been doing for the last several decades is not going to work moving forward. If you think about how many water programs, regardless of what type of water program it is, that are struggling for funding, if everything we were doing for the last 30 years was working, we wouldn't have these financial shortfalls that we're seeing right now. So we really need to think differently. We need to build support from the outside. We've got to really identify and engage key stakeholders. We've got to be more strategic in the way that we think about our programs. And a big part is we've got to be more politically relevant. We can't just assume people think it's okay to do. We've got to be more politically relevant and build political relevance. So you may ask, well, politically relevant, why? The bottom line is politics drives money. And I think that's been really obvious, particularly at the federal and state levels, um, if you haven't noticed it locally here in the last couple of years. And people, the other thing is, is that this idea of buy-in, people follow what they understand and what they believe in. And if they don't understand your program and they don't really believe in it, it's going to be really hard to get their support. And the bottom line is that old adage of the squeaky wheel gets the oil. If they're not hearing from you, it makes it really hard for people who want to support your program. So what does political relevancy look like? Like, how do you actually go about doing it? And these are just images of different people. Some of you may or may not recognize but, uh, some of these individuals, and you may, you may or may not um, uh, sort of associate or agree with these folks, but they're all politically relevant for different reasons. And the bottom line is, is that if, if the how really gets down to, you've got to be known and you got to be visible. And I, and I will say, for us introverts in the water world, that becomes really challenging. We've got to get ourselves out there because the bottom line is pe people connect to people. And then when they connect to you, they'll connect to your programs. So you got to be known and you got to be visible. You got to attend board and council meetings, attend community events, volunteer in community organizations. All of those things are important. The other part is developing personal relationships. This is really critical when it comes down to talking about money. The, the reality is, is that if you're gonna have an ask, which is really what it comes down to when you have valid initiatives or you're asking elected officials to approve funding for your program, is you're having an ask. Um, you, you've gotta be able to have personal relationships to do that. Know and engage community influencers. That idea of who are the movers and shakers in your community and how, how can you connect with them? developing alliances uh, and, and outside program champions. So who is it outside your program that can speak on your behalf? And the way that I always work with my clients is, who is it that if you had to go and stand in front of the, the assembly or the Senate or a committee or the county commission or your city council, who is it that you want standing next to you? Those are those outside champions that become really critical. Getting involved in local organizations. And then something I want to talk a little bit more about is developing a political strategy. And often when I bring this up, the first question that gets asked is, oh boy, what, you know, what's a political strategy? And I love this image because it's a full-size chessboard, and oftentimes many of us can feel like we're chess pieces uh, in a larger game. But it really is a good analogy to what needs to happen to gain political relevancy and put a political strategy together. And it really comes down to what are the activities that you're going to take to acquire or develop the, revel the relevance or to gain an advantage to secure the funding you need. It really just comes down to a set of questions and that set of questions uh, can vary depending on what it is that you want to do. But a political strategy does not need to be complicated. It really is just a set of questions and your answers to those questions. I will say that in the water world and in the infrastructure world, there is no playbook for political strategies. 
And so we have to look outside to figure out how we want to do this to help support us to get to those initiatives that John was speaking about earlier. And I really like uh, this infographic, which is from a website called eCanvasser, which is a website that often supports uh, local candidates uh, running for office. And they have this infographic that I find really powerful and useful. And th the key is, is that um, there's a couple of things from this that I think are worth, worth noting. One is the top left here, a campaign strategy should be 20% strategy and 80% implementation. And that's really the idea of, you can have a good idea, but if you can't get boots on the ground to implement it, you're gonna struggle to be successful. And I think that is really important. I don't want people to get too caught up in the idea of a political strategy, because it's really about the implementation. There are a few other things that are important, uh, including um, the doing a competitor analysis. And, and John actually mentioned this earlier, is if I'm gonna go out and ask people to support my program financially, I gotta know who I'm competing against. Who else is asking for that money? And not just in the infrastructure world, it may not just be roads or trails, it's libraries and schools, it's things outside of that. What else is pulling at people's purse strings that I need to understand who else is making ass at the same time I am? And doing that with understanding of the political landscape, what's important in the community at the given time? because timing can be very important. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there's a branding and messaging element to this, uh, including the personal branding. This idea of people want to connect with something, both visually and verbally, and often your face will be the point of the spear for your program. So having not necessarily personal branding for you, but personal branding for your program, and having really clear messaging that's going to elicit that emotional response that's important for you to be successful. So over the years of working on this, I've come up with uh, sort of uh, an idea of what a political strategy would look like for us in the water world. And I just wanna walk through that. So if we look at in terms of what's really important to get us to the end result of having more political relevance that leads to us garnering the funding and resources we need to be successful. The first thing is, is we've got to define what's important. In five years or 10 years or whatever long-term horizon it is, what's the desired outcome that we're looking for? What are we essentially trying to achieve with this program? We've got to define that right up front because that's often one of the first questions you'll get asked. Once you do that, then you got to assess your program and say, okay, what are we doing now that's helping us get there? What available resources are there to help us be successful and what gaps exist? Once we do that, then we can identify what are the necessary support structures? Who internally and externally do we need to help us basically put together and implement this political strategy? From there, we've got to define what it is that our ask is going to look like. What's the message or request that we're making? And we need to be really clear about that. From there, you can develop a communication strategy and, and then implement that plan. And it gets to you know, some of the nuances of that branding and messaging and how it's delivered, when it's delivered, and who it's delivered to. From there, you can execute the different strategies and actions that you've identified uh, within the plan. And the reality is, is that the entire time we're doing this, we're gonna learn. The idea of that adaptive management is really applicable to political strategies, especially in the water world. We got to document what kind of progress we're making and what kind of feedback we're, we're receiving so that we can adapt and be responsive. There are some projects, including some I've worked on uh, with John, where what we thought was going to be the messaging at the beginning of the project morphed tremendously by the end of the project when the ballot initiative went out. And so you need to be able to adapt because things change and priorities change. So this just kind of gives you a sense of what a political strategy for those of us in the water world uh, could look like. Here's just a few images that I found that, that I have found to be quite powerful and have led to successful uh, garnering of revenue for programs. John mentioned earlier, you know, upper left for those of you uh, on the on the webcast that are within Washoe County, the, the Save Our Schools, the, the WC1 from several years ago uh, to support the school district. You know, they had some clear messaging 
Uh, it was a successful ballot measure. For those of you that are familiar with the Lake Tahoe Basin, there's been a tremendous effort going on 25 years now to do um, major investments in protecting the resources within the Lake Tahoe Basin. It's called the Environmental Improvement Program. It's led by the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, and they branded this restoration in progress. And it's been very successful and very powerful. They've been able to garner hundreds of millions of dollars to invest uh, in the Tahoe Basin. You know, they're, they're, they're visually and verbally um, uh, appealing to the user to feel you can go and see some of these uh, items uh, on their website and, and they can appeal to a very broad audience. Uh, John and I actually worked with the city of Alameda in the Bay Area um, about 18 months or two years ago. They needed to uh, increase a fee to support their clean water program. Their tagline was protecting the Bay, protecting Alameda, which is particularly important because they're an island community. So sea level rise uh, due to climate change is, is really impactful in their community. So this idea of protection is, is uh, you know, tr really drives home within the community. On the right hand side is an infographic that we put together to support that initiative that was ultimately successful to, to garner dedicated local revenue for their program. And then um, the San Mateo Resource Conservation District, which is over on the peninsula um, uh, in the Bay Area, they have done some really interesting um, sort of outreach and ways to garner political relevance. And one of the things that they did is they went out to all of their local elected officials, their state elected officials, and their federal elected officials. And they found, uh, they spent time developing relationships and then got messaging and quotes from them that they put on their website and all of the outreach, outreach material that they use. And it's been really successful because a lot of people recognize these names, they recognize the positions, and it, they may not know the Resource Conservation District, but they know those people. And if those people trust it, then they'll trust it as well. So these are just some sort of practical examples of some of the things that I've just talked about in the previous slides. If there's one thing you take away from, from today's presentation is you just got to take the first step. Uh, this is my oldest child. He's now nine years old, but this is when he was just first starting to walk. And any of you that are familiar with kids, it's just everybody's wanting them to take that first step. And it sometimes is hard, but you're just, it's amazing how fast, if you just take a first step, how quickly things can start to steamroll in a positive direction. And the question that I often get asked is, okay, well, well what do I do? I'm not suggesting that everybody run out and put a political strategy together. It can be a little overwhelming, but if you take a first step, you may get to the point where you wanna put a political strategy together and then implement that strategy. So what are some of those simple things you can do? Um, well, you know, when I was responsible for, for running a program for a local jurisdictions, uh, some of the things that, the, what you see on the screen here are some of the things that I've used there that have been successful or things that I've seen others use or I've worked with jurisdictions in implementing that have proven to be successful. I mentioned it earlier, developing relationships with your elected officials and your management or executives is critically important. I can't tell you how many times I sit down with staff that are the head of a flood control district or uh, a clean water program or other, and I say, well, how well do you know your county executive? How well do you know your elected officials? And they'll say, oh, well, we haven't met with them in, in months. That's done by someone else. And it's, it's just a good reminder of you need to take the time. And every jurisdiction has different protocols for how that works. But you've got to find a way to make sure that your program has a relationship and a linkage to the management and executives of your organization, as well as your elected officials. One of the things that, that I've found to be really effective is hosting elected officials in the field days, particularly when projects have been built or something else significant has happened. If you talk to most elected officials, they love to find you know, any reason that they can get out of a, an office and get to a site and look at um, a project that they may have helped fund get finished. It's a great opportunity for you to get to spend some face time with those elected officials. And, uh, if, if you do it right and you give enough uh, advance notice, these elected officials in the field days can be really powerful. 
The other thing is that's often lost is creating a connection to your local media. Um, especially in medium and smaller size communities, the local media is often looking for content. And if you can offer to write a local column, develop a relationship with whether it's a digital or more traditional media source or even radio, uh, it's a really good way for you to make a connection with somebody who could be an outside champion for you. And then again, creating that br program branding and especially an attractive logo. I find so frequently that those of us in the water world will just adopt whatever the logo of our jurisdiction or district is. And it's too esoteric. It, it's not meaningful to your program. And so it, it doesn't create the connection that you're looking for. So sometimes developing a logo can be one of the simplest and most cost-effective ways to really start to create some relevance. And with that, I would just say, this is my contact information. If, if you have questions, I'm always happy to, to chat with people about this. Again, this is not something we often think about in the infrastructure and especially in the water world. I hope that you know, we can all move in that direction uh, and it's gonna take a collective effort and we're all gonna learn from each other. Uh, so Maureen, that's the, the end of, of my presentation. Well done, thanks so much. We do have a couple questions for you. Do you have an op opinion about the agency itself being the lead spokesman? Some experts suggest this more personal branding is critical for agency legitimacy. Uh, I'm not sure that I fully understand the question, but I think it's experience... having somebody within the agency be the be, be the spokesperson or the do the branding or the marketing as opposed to hiring a can uh, you know consulting firm to do it. Yeah, well, this is just my opinion. It absolutely needs to be internal. I certainly encourage a lot of the clients that I work with to bring in outside experts to help them sort of frame the message and the branding. But absolutely, ideally, you got to find someone internal who is going to be the face of your program because you just lose credibility if you go to a public meeting and the only person talking in the front of the room is a consultant, you really need to have somebody who's there, who's a part of it, who's living and breathing it every day. That makes sense. Okay, are there any drawbacks or risks to trying to increase your political relevance? Are there ways to make sure the results are positive? It's a two-part question. Certainly, anytime you put yourself out there, there's always the potential for risk. Uh, I would say that one of the important things that you need to do up front is think about what that risk would be. So really, when you think about your stakeholders, it's, it's not only who, who might be supportive of me, but who might also be in opposition, and why do they take that opposition position, and what can I do Maybe I can't change their mind, but can I can I get them to not come out vocally against what I'm doing? So there's always some risk, and you want to think about that up front. The to the second part of the question in terms of what can you do to to either increase or ensure success, I would say it's that idea of the strategic thinking and then having a plan and executing that plan. Um, I, I was actually had an experience several years ago where I was working with a jurisdiction. Um, they, they had a, a sort of a dire funding need. Uh, the gentleman at the time who was the public works director was just very adamant that we had to have a community meeting and it needed to happen immediately because we just, we needed to get this moving forward. And we, we sort of strongly encouraged that we might want to wait on having that community meeting, but for a variety of reasons, it needed to happen. It occurred. And in this case, this jurisdiction had not really done its homework to the level it needed to. And they had that community meeting. And, and the first question that was asked at that community meeting, which was filled with a couple hundred people, was why do you need this funding and how did you come up with that number? And they hadn't done that justify your need um, in detail yet. So they didn't have a defensible number. That initiative was over right there. So. Mm -hmm. The key is you got to you got to plan it out. You got to be strategic, and and that idea of John mentioned earlier a minimum of 12 months. It's 12 months to do the initiative. You should be thinking about critical strategic engagement 
strategic outreach probably two, maybe even three years before you might want to move forward for an ask. And then maybe even with uh, just trying to gather what your costs are, we've worked with some communities who are going out into the field and trying to identify where their storm drains and their green infrastructure are and just trying to put all those things together. Yeah. So, so be a risk taker, but be prepared. Yep. Uh, let's see, one more question. Um, how do you get a branding campaign funded? Good question. Um, if you're struggling for money, how do you come up with the money to do this? Um, oftentimes what I find is, is that uh, if your program has some, uh, some budget for outreach, you can, the first place you can look is, can we use some of the outreach budget that you have to come up with the branding and messaging for your program? The other piece is, is if you give this some thought and you are able to articulate the importance of whatever initiative is or gaining um, more support for your program, and you can lay out a plan that says, here's where we are now, here's where we want to be. In order to get there, we, we need to have, we need to be more known in the community. And in order to do that, we need to put a branding pro, you know, we, we have to have a, a branding initiative and here's what it's going to cost. And sometimes it can take, you know, more than one funding cycle to, to be able to do that. Um, and that reminds me of something I forgot to mention earlier. The, the idea of shifting our mindset and, and gaining political relevancy, I think is as important at, for the level of going and fighting for general fund money as it is for going after, say, a ballot initiative that John talked about and everything in between. If we want to garner more general fund money, we got to do the same things. We've, just got, we've got to increase our relevance and we've got to shift how we go about doing that. Jason, thanks so much for joining us today and sharing your expertise. Appreciate it. We're going to go ahead and move on. Um, I am going to, Tess, you can go ahead and give Tess, or I'm sorry, give Kim Rigdon the, uh, the, the presentations, presentation access, and I'll introduce Kim. Uh, Kim Rigdon has served as the state Source Water Protection Coordinator for the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection for the past 13 years. Kim received a bachelor's in science civil engineering degree from the University of Nevada, Reno. She has nearly 20 years of experience in water and wastewater strategic planning. Kim is the program manager of Nevada's Integrated Source Water Protection Program and works with a myriad of federal, state, and local stakeholders and partners to develop and implement countywide programs and plans to protect community drinking water supplies. And so Kim, thanks for joining us, for joining us today. Kim um, was able to coordinate with um, Commissioner Vaughn Hartung, and um, who's gonna talk to us right now. And I'll let Kim go ahead and introduce him. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Maureen. I'm gonna go ahead and switch my slide as I introduce um, Commissioner Hartung. Um, let me know if you, can you see it okay? I just wanna, I, I struggle. That's great. Okay. Looks great. Oh, great. Great. So I just wanted to start with um, giving you kind of a little better understanding of what my relationship is with Washoe County and how I came to know Commissioner Hartung. Um, my planning work with communities over the past 13 years with NDP, um, doing source water protection plan planning, which is a countywide approach to getting all public water systems in a community to look at how they can protect that resource from a countywide regional approach, um, can sometimes involve you know, multiple agencies, um, city councils and county commissions, as well as um, small improvement districts and, and homeowners associations. And so we have a variety of governmental utility type agencies that we work with and we try to bring together for this larger approach. And one of the questions that we always get from our stakeholders is, how do we get public support for and finance water programs and projects? And so after working to complete um, these programs in eight of the communities that we've done across Nevada, it's been my experience and, and in adding to the complimentary discussions that John and Jason has, have provided as far as marketing and branding and, and getting stakeholder buy-in and finding local champions is that you really have to believe in your product. Um, 
I have been a champion of source water protection, selling safe drinking water is, is kind of an easy sell because people get that concept, they understand. But when you combine that with them then integrating any type of planning development code or other measures that might be politically difficult, then you really have to be able to sell and get behind your program and, and really help them to understand what the goals are. And you need to have a mutual learning experience and understanding of the politics and the economic desires of the community and what, your, what priorities you're going to be competing with. So whether it's a fully grant funded program, a loan program, or any other type of program, really having that mutual stakeholder um, interaction and learning process of, of the community that you're in is super important. And so with that, almost four years ago, NDP co-presented um, with some Washoe County staff and Truckee Meadows Water Authority staff um, that we had relationships with to the local and regional planning boards. And we asked the boards to formally, this is our political strategy, is to formally invite NDEP and our technical assistance grant funding and our technical assistance provider into the community to bring designated staff together and use that, that working group to prepare a regional plan that will protect the community's drinking water supply. And we've also incorporated watershed planning into that process, particularly in Washington County because of the Truckee River. And so um, our next guest speaker, Commissioner Von Hartung, led multiple boards. Um, you can see by the, the slide that I have up, um, Commissioner uh, Hartung is very, very involved in the Washoe County as a whole. He not only works for Washoe County, but multiple boards that are interlocal, um, coordinating and collaborating boards for a, a plenty of a different, a variety of, of different agendas and, and um, programs and plans. Um, but Mr. Hartung led multiple boards to support the planning effort and last year led them to unanimously, this is, this is the, we have a, you know, two cities and a county to unanimously approve a countywide integrated source water and watershed protection plan for all public water systems and the Truckee River and the Truckee Meadows. And this was a four year planning effort that resulted in a regional plan to protect the community's drinking water supplies and the water quality in the Truckee River. Um, the most challenging part of introducing a leader like Commissioner Hartog is attempting to summarize briefly his tremendous contributions to and support of water programs in the Truckee Meadows. I could probably do a standalone presentation to cover it all, but we don't have that amount of time, so I'm going to try to do it justice here. Commissioner Hartung has been named by the Water Environment Federation as the 2020 Public Official of the Year. This international award recognizes our commissioner as an elected public official who has made a significant contribution through government service that resulted in the improvements to the water environment. In addition, the Nevada Water Environment Association gave Commissioner Hartung and at the time Governor Sandoval jointly the 2018 Public Official of the Year Award. Commissioner Hartung currently serves as chairman of the Western Regional Water Commission, chairman of the Truckee Meadows Water Authority Board of Directors, and chairman of the Truckee River Flood Management Authority. And as you can see from the slide, he also serves as the vice chair, member, or alternate on numerous other decision-making boards in the community. He has actively supported the development of the Nevada Water Innovation Institute at the University of Nevada, Reno. And in 2020, the Institute Director, Krishna Pigia, recognized Commissioner Hartung with the following statement. Commissioner Hartung has been a champion of the University of Nevada and particularly the Nevada Water Innovative Institute, Innovation Institute. He was a champion for the Institute from day one and continues to work hard for the university to be a leader in water research and development and at the forefront of addressing regional water challenges and opportunities. Through his leadership position, he has been instrumental in the growth of the university's water programs. When it comes to water use and reuse, Commissioner Hartung has been the eyes and ears of the community, and he consistently advocates that all water projects in the region incorporate public and K-12 education. On a more personal note, Commissioner Hartung has lived in Washoe County for over 40 years with his wife, Sandra, of 36 years, and Vaughn and Sandra have a son and daughter, both graduates of the University of Nevada, Reno. 
Uh, our beloved commissioner is formerly an adjunct faculty member teaching at both the Truckee Meadows Community College and the University of Nevada, Reno for nearly 20 years. Commissioner Hartung is here today to share with us what helps him get behind and support a water program. So I please welcome uh, Commissioner Vaughn Hartung and Commissioner, you should be able to unmute and begin whenever you are ready. Hey, thank you so much. I Can I just quit now? No. <laughs> would prefer to do that <laughs> that's what a what a, a very nice open thank you so much um I, I i really don't know where to start i thought i did know where to start but i really don't know where to start but i'm i'm, I'm going to talk to you briefly about how um i was convinced initially to become involved um and of course water is easy to have a passion about because who doesn't need water I mean, that's it's a very simple question. Everybody needs fresh, clean, pure water, period. End of discussion. So championing these programs for me was a, a, an honor. And as you're looking for an elected official to champion your program, whatever it happens to be, you have to find someone who naturally has a personal passion. And, and once you determine that that they do have a passion then some simple steps that that um, i used actually when i own my own business i i have been self-employed my entire life uh other than and i'm still on my own business but other than being an elected official and, and of course working for uh, the educational systems but when we would sell a product we would plant seeds so that the the product that we were selling in this concept became our customer's idea and when you when you have your champion when you know that that this elected official is is passionate about it when you plant small seeds and then let the whole thing become their idea because who doesn't love something that's their own idea so um, you know, a couple of the questions that have been asked of me um, uh, are, are, are these kinds of things. What's the biggest hurdle to, to overcome when you decide to support a program? Um, and and in, in the elected world, many times, um, you know, we look at, is there a need? Because some people show up with, with ideas and concepts and, and you look at the general need and, and they're, they're just, isn't one it, it, it's a it's a very small group um, what are both the long and short term um, funding opportunities and and if there aren't funding opportunities then you have to start thinking outside the box to say okay well if, if there is a need what are the funding opportunities available and then you can kind of work your way backwards uh, some of the earlier speakers john and jason both touched on funding opportunities um and and I'll, I'll try to go into some of those here in just a second because in nevada and washoe county you know um our bandwidth for property taxes is very narrow because of a property tax cap that was enabled by the legislature so we have to use other methodologies to kind of come up with ideas as to how we can fund and and um and, and ultimately get a program on the ground um Another question that has been asked is, is in a situation where there are equally important programs competing for resources, how do you choose? And so, again, we go back to public desire. And, and for me, it was always efficiency and reuse, and then, of course, water quality. And when you're dealing with those kinds of things, it, it's easy to, uh, again, um, try to make some determinations. Now, sometimes you just have to you know compete one against another and and uh, there there just is no short answer to this um so the the other question that that sort of leads into this is is what makes a program appealing to to me or to an elected official many of the things that we've looked at are of course what's the cost benefit and and when you have a program that that is very expensive uh, and I'll use our flood management authority in just a second, of, of which I'm now the current chairman. Um, the, the, as we look at, at 
that particular program, the cost benefit ratio is sometimes hard to justify. And, and um, it was very difficult and in fact impossible to get the federal government to justify it. The Army Corps of Engineers would not um, agree because we did not have a high enough cost benefit ratio. Uh, that said, then we have to look at it as, as you know, protection of assets and, and are we protecting the public and, and you know, what is the, uh, the, the, the general benefit going to be? Um, so I'll, I'll just use the example of our flood management authority for just a, in just a quick second. John talked about it. Um, it was enabled by a piece of legislation. It, it is funded by sales tax. There is a one um, eight cent sales tax. And uh, as John mentioned, we were able to couple flood management with our emergency operations center and the legislature funded that for us through a, again, a, an, an eight cent of sales tax. That one sixteenth goes to the emergency operations center to pay down the debt, the debt service and the bond. And the other one sixteenth goes to the flood management authority. And we have funded over time um, pieces of the project, but uh, the the overall project is still a little elusive because it's just under three hundred million dollars, and that's that's still just a little bit out of our our funding mechanism. Although we still we do believe that that there are some fairly substantial pieces that we can get done fairly soon. I say fairly soon. Uh, it seems like these things move geologically because we're still not starting um, uh, on on some of these things for a, a few years. So th the if you can convince the legislature, um, then you can you can enable an, an overall tax like using sales tax. The Washington County Commission doesn't have the ability to just enable those taxes, although I will tell you the legislature did give the flood management authority the ability to enable a fee. And people don't understand the difference between fees and taxes, believe me. So so when you when you start trying to sell this stuff. Uh, there are no differences between a fee and a tax. Um, and we've been very resistant to enable that because um, in Washoe County, because Washoe County is, as if, if you're from Washoe County, you already know this, 6,500 plus square miles. Uh, so you take the people who live um, out, let's say where I live in Spanish Springs, and I'll talk about the flood, the stormwater utility we have in Spanish Springs and how that was funded in just a second. Uh, but you, you know, you take a you take a, a homeowner like myself, and 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 I live you know 11 or 12 miles away from the river. Where's the direct benefit for me to fund that project other than to save the center of the valley? But but you know, there's a lot of competing interests. So um, it 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 becomes very difficult for those of us in a position to uh, enable those fees to say is is this equitable? And that's, that's the very difficult part. Now, let me just take a left turn here. Where I live, um, we have a stormwater utility and we've had it since uh, the 90s. Now it was, it, it, the, the genesis of it was actually from a lawsuit. The, the city of Sparks sued Washoe County, the unincorporated area of Washoe County and Spanish Springs because our, our flows were uh, exceeding what their infrastructure could handle. And the flows were not being attenuated coming out of the Spanish Springs Valley. So um, at the time, there was a, a, a developer who actually um, had an idea that they would fund the entire stormwater utility for, in exchange uh, for rather, um, an entitlement to build 1,750 houses. The commission at the time decided, no, we're not going to give this entitlement. The developer uh, was willing to do all of these offsite improvements and, and literally fund this thing from top to bottom. County commission decided, no, we're not gonna do that. So um, we, the residents, um, had to pay for it. It started out as a few dollars a month. It's now up to $9.31 a month. It is, for all intents and purposes, we call it a stormwater utility. It's a, it's a special assessment district. There's no other way to, to define that. And um, it's only the unincorporated area of the county that pays into our specific special assessment district. 
Um, and, and then the city of Sparks, as um, I don't remember, I think it was John who also mentioned this, that the city of Sparks does it through their sewer connection fee or through their sewer fees. So the, their portion is funded that way. Now, here's the interesting part about this, this story. Uh, within five years, the uh, county commission, the regime had changed. The developer got all 1,750 entitlements and we still got to pay. So if there is an opportunity to uh, create these public-private partnerships where off-site improvements can be done in exchange for uh, entitlements, especially when the entitlements are, are legal by law, that they're ultimately going to get them. I mean, there's always this, this um, sort of anti-growth uh, uh, thought process of, of folks who move into areas and say, well, um, you know, I don't like the growth. I moved here to get away from growth, and and it, it's it's counterintuitive, but it does happen all the time. I hear this argument all the time, and I've I've lived in this valley for 34 years in the same home, so um, you you know that the, the development is going to occur. If there are ways that you can get that public-private partnership, it it can help leverage or sometimes pay for in its entirety uh, a, a particular project. Um, and so the, the sort of the next piece of this um, is, is um, what, what some of the questions are, um, how do you attract public officials by giving them presentations and, and you know, get, getting them engaged and, and um, what's, what's educational for us? The, you know, the, the, the biggest problem is is that um, in in many cases we're we're dealing with with issues that are far beyond our ability to to understand the technical data, not the political issues, but the technical data of what's in front of us. It's very complex stuff. So you have to have patience with your elected officials. And I say it this way: patience is the art of hiding your impatience with someone who has um, less ability, uh, not ability, but but a less of an understanding because they just don't have the same educational background that, that you may have. So, um, and you have to remember that these folks are gonna make decisions for you. And, and so you have to be very, very patient with them. Um, so, so, you know, again, I'll go back to the planting seeds to make the concept their idea. My staff does this all the time. They'll come in and they'll go, they'll give me little tidbits and they'll say, you know, commissioner, we should do, you know, this and this. And, and if we kind of had this and that, and, and then I start thinking about it and then, you know, it starts to become my own idea because I add into the stew. Anytime you can get a, an elected official to get behind your concept because it's their idea, you know, now you can, you can go through the process of getting them to add it into a CIP or you know some other specific funding mechanisms that that may exist. Again, property tax for us is a really really difficult scenario. I want to back up and talk about another thing that that John talked about, which was the two WC ones. Now the flood management authority wanted to put a a, um, a ballot measure uh, out and 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 try to convince the public to fund the overall project. Here's the problem. When there's no flood, there's no issue. How do you convince people to spend money when there isn't a flood or hasn't been one in quite a number of years? It becomes very, very difficult. And so when you compete against things like educational measures, it, it's just impossible. So we pulled back by a year. Uh, they did the Save Our Schools initiative uh, which was a very effective initiative. Um, and, and I think it was Jason that was talking about um, how it could be funded and how you could deal with those, you know, with, with the outreach. Um, technically, it's illegal for us to spend public dollars on outreach. So you have to get maybe a citizens group behind it or, you know, some group that, that, can, that can fund that outreach, but it becomes very, very difficult. And we had no outreach at the Flood Management Authority that was, that was effective at all. 
So when that ballot initiative came forward on the next cycle, um, it, it, um, it, it failed. Now, there's a couple of ways that you can, that you can do this. You can, ask an, you can ask your elected officials to put an advisory question on the ballot. And that advisory question can give you some insight as to one, you know, what's the, what's the public will, what's the desire, and two, it can help you formulate a real ballot initiative that, that you know, because you can kind of manipulate things around when that real ballot initiative comes along that, that is binding. But just, a, you know, a ballot question is not binding, but it really gives, it gives us political officials, the electeds, the ability to say, yeah, we can support that or no, we can't. And then finally, um, the, the idea here is um, to, to look at, at programs and, and, and things that, that you can get elected officials to sink their teeth into. You know, are there particular benefits? Um, and, and so for me, it's always been about resiliency and sustainability of our water supply. That's, that's the convincing measure for me. When we talk about resiliency and we talk about uh, uh, sustainability, those kinds of things go well beyond any elected official's term in office. I'm in my last term, I'm in my third term. So uh, after another three and a half years, I'll be done as a county commissioner. And I'll, in fact, I'll be done as an elected official. I'm, I'm ready to retire. That said though, you always want to try to initiate, we always want to try to initiate programs that will outlive us, that, that will have a legacy uh, effort. So I think I've, I've overstayed my welcome here. Uh, the worst thing you can do is give an elected official a mic. Um, so I'm, I'm going to turn it over to any questions that um, anyone might have. Thank you, Vaughn. Um, I, I have a quick question, just because I'm on with you already, if I can, Maureen. You, you know, I, I really think about this a lot in my program particularly and how we can because i know getting to the developers up front and part of source water protection planning is working with the planning departments to have these upfront conversations with the developers so that we can incorporate these you know program goals into their development process so you know aside from working with the planning departments who're doing a great job working with us and and having those upfront conversations are there ways to take some something like source water protection education into the developer realm so that we can maybe have conversation before it even gets to the planning department level where we can start having these conversations and 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 help them to become more aware of you know that the preventative approach makes things less expensive in the long run because we're we're taking care of the resource no that's a great question um i i recently um and I'm gonna I'm gonna take the credit for this. I recently convinced a developer out north of town to look at one their carbon footprint. What what was what were they actually creating in terms of a carbon footprint when they did this development? And and then I planted the seed with them. And this is not a new concept. I didn't you know sit up at two o'clock in the morning and go, oh my God, I've got this great idea. I planted the seed with them to create an agri hood so that all of the open space in their development would be agricultural and could be essentially dealt with by um, a, a few different ways. Um, one, retention of stormwater on their own property so that, so that virtually no water, or, or let's say virtually no water would flow off so that they would, they would literally um, retain that. Uh, and use it for their own purposes. Now, there's some issues, but it depends on where you are. But but in this particular case, because they were out north of town, uh, everybody was behind that concept. And then um, they also looked at using effluent to water some of these crops that that you know grapes and and you know fruit trees and etc. That where effluent could be utilized. So. If you can get the developer to start looking at their um, just just how they're impacting their communities, I think you can get them to make some substantial changes that that um, 
make their developments very attractive and then they make their developments attractive to the existing residents because who doesn't love a farmer's market in their own neighborhood uh, of, of fruits and vegetables that are grown right in their in their own backyards literally so that can that can really help to to just um, kind of convince people as to the the efficacy of of what you're suggesting Kim. Yeah, thanks. I'm going to hand the time over to Maureen because she's monitoring the questions. I kind of jumped in there and took over. Yeah, we actually have one question and it says, you already mentioned that Save Our Schools, but are there other effective K-12 educational programs that you've seen and would encourage others to pursue? Um, I, I, I'm not sure how that pertains to water, uh, but I, I think as it relates to water, either trying to do education for water to get students to I, understand okay. the value of water. Right, right. Well, you know, you know, so so some of the some of the K-12 programs here in here in Washoe County, one of the first things, in fact, I, I love to teach kids about this. The Truckee River watershed is amazing, starting with Lake Tahoe. Um, you know, 6,223 feet above sea level, 6,229.1 is the dam, holding back 744,600 acre feet of water. You go down one level and you've got, uh, you know, Donner, you go down one level and you've got Independence, and I can rattle off the numbers, 17,500 acre feet of storage and Independence, and then you've got Prosser and, you know, 49,000 acre, 800 acre feet there, and, and blah, 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 all the way down to Stampede. If you can get these kids to to recognize, and I, I hope I'm answering the question effectively here, I, I, I'm not sure that I am, but if you can get them to recognize how precious our watershed is and how resilient it can be by, by measures that, that we can take by um, indirect potable reuse and treating to a class A plus standard where um, you know, we're able to recycle that water in our system and you start them early on that thought process and it, and they, they really can embrace that, um, as, as they get older and, and they'll end up in Krishna Pagila's program, uh, you know, being water researchers. So I don't know whether I've answered the question, uh, but. No, but so, sounds great. Yeah. It's just encouraging them to, to have the value of of water as a res water as a resource and conservation and clean water and uh, multiple benefits and that kind of thing. Water is a finite resource. Finite resource. You know, when I was a kid, we never thought about that. You left the faucet on when you brushed your teeth. You turned the hose on while you were washing the car, and you just let it run down the street. Uh, when you teach your kids now. Uh, and, and the programs that are being taught in the schools that that water is really a precious resource and and it's an asset for us and how do we how do we make it go as far as we possibly can um i mean you're miles ahead great okay. kim and commissioner hartung thanks so much for joining us today uh, commissioner hartung thanks for all your work in the water world and uh, for your years of, of service and supporting that. Um, we have, um, let me see, Tess, if you can give me your um, back controls, I'm gonna close things out for the day. Thank you. Maureen, I don't know if you saw, there was one more question that popped up in the box. Oh, no, I did not see that, thank you. You know, I will. I'm still on. Open. Oh, great. Okay. Let me uh, read the question off to you. Let's see. It looks like there's a couple of them. Um, Kim and Vaughn, are there any initiatives for the developers to do this other? It doesn't say this other. The developers I've approached always want something that benefits them. Oh, wait. Let me, let me, okay. There's a correction here. Kim and Vaughn, are there any incentives for the developers to do this? The developers I've approached always want something that benefits them. Um, I'll 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 try to take a stab at that. And and yeah, I mean, you know, they're in business to make money. But 
um, the planning process can be extremely difficult and and long and arduous, even when uh, you have land use that allows what they're asking for. It can still be difficult because it's not just water that you're dealing with. It's other, you know, it's it's uh, ADTs, uh, average daily trips on the roads, and and et cetera. And so, so this this thought that that you know that it just has to benefit them. Um, it, it, I bring it around full circle to them. I say, look, if you want to get through the public process, you have to convince the people that live in the area um, how your project could potentially benefit them. And that's where potentially some of those offsite improvements can come in uh, that, that will also could uh, ultimately benefit them as well, because I'll use the example in, in uh, some of the North Valley's areas where um, very old subdivisions that were built in the 60s and the 70s have literally no stormwater uh, drainage whatsoever. I mean, they have some V ditches, but but it's it's really not very um, uh, it's not very well planned. It's not planned at all. It's just they're just they just happen to be there. So the 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 idea here is is that they have to do some offsite improvements, but what it does is it paves the way for the developer to get an easier um, uh, approval in that public process because um, the, the the hard part is 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 perception is nine tenths of the law when you're going through the planning commission and then potentially regional planning and then if you have to do some appeals uh, to higher boards or you know to commissions or to city councils it can be very very difficult if public sentiment is not in your favor so the the, the more that they can get the public on board. Um, it benefits them in the long term because it allows them to time their project more effectively and get it on the ground. Time is money. I don't know whether I've answered the question, but um, those are the those are the, the the strategies I've used. I think you did. Thank you. Thank you again for your time. Okay, is that the only question? So that's what we had. Yeah, I um. So I'm going to go ahead and close things out for the day and thank everybody. We went a little bit over. Um, but super, super informative. Thank you to all our speakers, John, Jason, Kim, and Vaughn, Commissioner Hartung, for joining us. Um, we have, reminder, we have two more webinars regarding specific to Nevada funding water programs. Next week, we'll talk about how to start planning your projects, thinking about putting applications together for project, um, capital improvement project, in particular funding. And we'll have some talks on that next Tuesday, the 25th. And on the 27th, we will be um, bringing in representatives from state, federal, and local agencies who have money and want to and want to you know get it to you to build your projects. So please join us. This webinar was recorded. We will be sending you a, a link to the recording um, shortly after we hang up today. So thank you. Have a wonderful Thursday, and hope to see you next week. Take care. <laughs>